With you now on the newsfeed late night, thanks for staying on. The Basic Education Department announced the delayed reopening of schools by two weeks to the 15th of February due to concerns about the second wave of the coronavirus. But teachers are expected to return to school from the 1st of February. The National Professional Teachers Organization of South Africa says it doesn't understand why teachers should return to school two weeks before schools reopen as historically teachers would return two or three days before learners reopen to complete preparations. They also say that this will put educators at a greater risk of contracting COVID-19. Joining me now to unpack this is Neptosa Executive Director Basil Manuel. Basil, good to have you with us tonight on the Newsfeed Late Night. It seems there is, of course, a lot of confusion around uh, this communication of the delayed reopening of schools. One of the issues that you're raising now is why are teachers uh, are having to come back early uh, two weeks before the learners come back? Uh, is this, uh, I mean, something that was uh, ventilated in the, in, the, in the briefing that you got from the Department of Basic Education? That's exactly the point. Good evening. First of all, this was not ventilated in that particular meeting. We discussed at length, of course, the return of the learners, and we supported it that, in fact, because of the, uh, the second wave and because of the expected peak, that it would make good sense uh, to delay the opening. And we were to discuss the uh, return of teachers in this coming week. And, of course, that was not to be because an announcement was made. But just to sketch our real concern, when you look at it, 800,000 education workers will be returning, 400,000 teachers, about 100,000 uh, support staff and governing body paid staff, and then 300,000 uh, additional people that are now employed at the schools. That is a huge number that is going to flood into schools, and surely their lives must matter as well. It can't be that the education department doesn't value their lives as much as the lives of children. And this is the point we are making. We are saying, if this is about health and safety, we've got to look at the health and safety of close to 800,000 people. Yeah. And that is, would, would be a direct contradiction, isn't it? So you're saying 800,000 people will now be going back and forth because they're saying the reason is, is largely because they want to reduce the movement of people. Now, you would be allowing 800,000 people to move two weeks even before the schools reopen. What, what would be the benefit of that if it's not as opposed to get the teachers to the schools to, 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 to make preparations uh, for, for, for learners to return? under the, the stricter protocols. This is exactly what we are saying. We are saying uh, it is part of the school dynamic, part of the DNA of schools to ensure that preparations are done the year before so that when we get to school the first day of school, things are ready. Now, that having been done, what, are, what is going to happen at school? Besides thousands of people using public transport, thousands of people getting to school and probably clustering. And because if you have nothing to do, people start sitting around, they become comfortable with one another. We haven't seen one another. And that's where the inherent danger lies. And we are asking, what exactly is the rationale? What has informed this? If it is only simply just the view that is, oh, the people are being paid, they must be at school. We are saying we are not opposed to people being at school. In fact, we wanted schools to open when they were originally scheduled. But health and safety has determined otherwise. And that is why we are saying let's take into account the health and safety of everybody, not paying lip service to it, but showing the teachers and the education workers at large that we have to consider their health and safety as well. Yeah. I mean, judging from what you're saying, are you suspecting that it's just purely a ticket uh, clocking exercise that, well, look, you're on a ticket, uh, you're being paid, so you've got to show your face and at least uh, tick on that timeline? Absolutely. That, that is the only logical explanation that there can be. There's nothing else. But I will tell you, we had a meeting today, and I cannot see that this will be changing. But tomorrow we will be submitting as unions uh, our memorandum about this because we had waited for today's meeting. And, um, but the, the attitudes were not that we will be meeting one another halfway. The attitudes appeared to be one that says, this is a decision made and this is how we're going to run with it. Come hell or high water.
Yeah. What is the conversation around those meetings that you're having on the prioritization of uh, uh, teachers as uh, essential service uh, so they can uh, come up in terms of the list and be on the phase one of the rollout of the vaccines? Well, our meetings haven't discussed the vaccine because there is a, a complete understanding that uh, education workers are part of those frontline workers. We agree that right at the top of the pile must be the health workers. However, given the exposure teachers have, and as we heard Professor Karim say even this evening, that this particular strain of the, this virus is highly transmissible. And uh, we then see teachers as a particularly, uh, uh, in a particularly dangerous situation. And that is why we want to see them right at the top. And I think there's general buy-in for that. Um, we just need to know how exactly the, 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 the vaccine is going to roll out. I don't think any of us know. And this is where our concerns lie. We are worried about teachers who have comorbidities. And uh, of course, also the senior teachers, senior in age, that is. And um, all those groupings become serious concern. We can't afford to lose our senior teachers. They are the ones with the experience and the expertise that must teach the younger generation too. So we want to see that this is rolled out to, to teachers as soon as possible. Now, back to what we were talking about earlier on. I mean, do you see a situation where teachers could simply be able to do the work that they are supposedly uh, going to be doing from the 1st of February till the 15th at home? Well, in fact, that's a very good question. And this is something we were debating even now early evening, because certainly if it is about preparation of things, take, for example, class lists. These were done last year. If you want to uh, pep them up, of course you can do them at home. And I understand that uh, teachers must go ahead of learners to school, but even three or four days has always proven to be enough. I cannot see why what the department thinks we should be doing at school can't be done at home. You're talking here at, at, at a teacher load and a teacher allocation that probably is not um, the same to what you're used to because of the uh, various dynamics that comes with COVID-19. Other learners are probably attending on a Monday, Wednesday and a Thursday, others coming on a Tuesday. And, and therefore, there are a lot of movable parts here. Uh, is this work that teachers will be able to, to, to do at home without having to, to report at school? I think that um, the dynamics of planning for that, we've gone through a year where we've had that, and I think uh, most schools have now settled into a method of doing this. Insofar as sitting down and, and linking siblings so that when parents bring children to school, they don't come every day, they come uh, on those alternate days because the siblings have been grouped. That is stuff that you are sitting and doing around the table, and you can jolly well do it uh, at a, uh, in, in your home. And what we are saying is that we've got to be reasonable, not only with the teachers, but education workers as well. When once that building has been cleaned, what is it that we want those many, many people to do? Uh, grass has been cut, etc. Are they really going to be sitting around all this time and that is when you start having unnecessary absenteeism and you have disciplinary issues that aren't really disciplinary issues and that is what we are appealing for good common sense there are concerns finally uh basil before i let you go that uh, because of uh, the rate of infection but not only that the the rate of of deaths in 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 the country we might be facing severe teacher shortages in 2021 what's your view Absolutely. And not uh, so much shortages of, of the, the sheer number, but shortages in, in your specialist subjects. You think about the junior primary and you think about grade one teachers. Some people think that they just pop up all over the show. That's not true. You know, very often we focus on the high flying subjects like maths and science, and, and we should. Because if you lose a maths teacher out in the rural area, do you really think you're going to get a maths teacher by tomorrow? Hardly likely. And so too with physics. And that starts changing the school dynamic. They suddenly start offering a more basic curriculum. 
and that robs children of an opportunity. So yes, there are major issues that lie ahead. If you think of the fact that we've lost between 1,750 and 2,000 teachers, and they have to be replaced, some of them in very, very specialist areas, we can see a problem on looming on the horizon. Add to that the normal retirements, the normal uh, uh, resignations and so on that are still happening. And then you end up with a very, very large number of teachers that are exiting the system. Basil, I appreciate your time and thank you very much uh, for joining us. That's Neptosa's Executive Director there, Basil Manuel.